origin, louder? All right, I'll shout. <laughs> the origin of this session, like so many, lies in a conversation in the pub after a long day of presentations, although not a tag, uh, but rather the long-running uh, theoretical Roman archaeology conference, or track, um, between uh, Rob and myself. Uh, that con uh, conversation concerned the stars uh, t television series Spartacus, um, violent, pornographic, and uh, by the fourth series, if not before, um, increasingly ludicrous. Also though, oddly compulsive, despite the disturbed sleep that both of us experienced as the, a result of exposure to yet another improbable way of decapitating someone, um, we kept watching, hooked by some small detail or plot twist which perfectly captured, or jarringly misrepresented, life in first century BC Southern Italy. Uh, that conversation uh, resulted in the organization of a session at Trek at Le in Leicester earlier this year on the relation between archaeology and fictional representations of the past. In particular, we were uh, pleased to attract speakers who span both groups, uh, trained archaeologists who have also published historical novels related to their research. We also drew in uh, researchers working on reception studies in classics, and we were all spellbound by Michael Gibbon's dramatic story about his experiences in the copper mines of C uh, Cyprus. After lively discussion, there was consensus that we should explore this topic further, and most obviously broaden out chronologically from our original Roman focus. This, after uh, sessions, uh, this afternoon session is the result, um, and we are very happy to welcome back some speakers for the previous session and also to welcome some new contri uh, contributors um, to, uh, who responded to our call for papers. Since starting research on this topic, uh, we've been repeatedly struck by how much of it, uh, has already been done. Um, so why do we feel that more is necessary now? Much of the work uh, we have discovered is fr fragmented across different disciplines, sub-disciplines, or treat it as an ancillary subject to such topics as outreach or teaching. One of the goals of this session uh, is to bring together some of the people working on broadly similar themes, but scattered within and beyond the discipline, to share ideas and approaches, and uh, we are very happy to see such a, uh, a large crowd. <coughs> so do discuss with us at the end. Most of the discussion uh, on this topic has not explicitly considered fiction as an academic tool. Many of the arguments for and against fiction that we will be discussing have been formulated in discussions on the limits of standard academic practice, i.e. how close to the facts should scholars stick. Much of the recent work on the use of fiction and imagined narratives in archaeology has positioned itself as a critique of uh, detached, objective scientific accounts. However, controversy about going beyond the facts long predates uh, the post-processual post -processual debate. For example, Sir Mortimer Wheeler's 1939 review of R.G. Collingwood's uh, Roman Britain and the uh, English Settlements objects that he interpolates motives, builds characters, constructs episodes with a liberality or even license that is great fun, but is liable to shock the pedant. Fact and speculation stand shoulder to shoulder. Interestingly, just a few years later, Wheeler published his own reconstruction of the uh, Storming of Maiden Castle, widely cited as, an, as a classic example of imaginative archaeological writing. And he writes, Men and women, young and old, were savagely cut down before the legionaries were called to heel. That night, where the fires of the legion shone out in orderly lines across the valley, the survivors crept forth from their broken stronghold and in the dark buried their dead. Collingwood's own influence, so that's Collingwood, um, on historical thinking and historical uh, and history education has been profound. His reenactment doctrine, sometimes dubbed historical empathy, although he did not use the term, argues that by reenacting thought processes, ancient motives and actions can be ac accessed. By occupying the historical actor's place as thinker of the thought, the actual historical thought is present in the mind. Of the, uh, of the scholar. It requires the scholar to imagine being in the historical actor's shoes with full consideration 
of all the factors that may have had bearing on the decisions of said actor. This approach entails the suspension of the scholar's own preconceptions, prejudices and knowledge of how the events will play out later. It is important to, to, to realize that for Collingwood, this is an objective process. It uses the scholar's imagination, but it is not an invention nor a fiction. Um, and we will come back to, our, uh, to Collingwood later uh, in our own paper. Meanwhile, what of the imagined or fictional accounts of, past, uh, of the past produced outside of archaeology? Such as TV, films, novels. <laughs> Many academic responses to these have focused on issues such as authenticity, or rather inauthenticity. Um, uh, and a, a, a little warning is uh, perhaps necessary. Um, there is some uh, colourful language involved in this. beyond the mountains to the north. Their torches bear west. West? They're swinging around to attack the villages below the pass. Uh, our villages. Slippery little cunts. So that was Spartacus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you can see what we're talking about. I mean, various responses to that, but one of mine is Although you couldn't see very well in the, in the slight gloom there, but was, surely they'd wear some more clothes in the middle of winter. But beyond nitpicking, an emphasis on authenticity can bring benefit. By eliciting criticism, such fictional representations may encourage scholars to think more critically uh, and carefully about a topic or to investigate new areas. Authenticity, however, is only one measure by which novelists and filmmakers and their audiences evaluate success. Others, perhaps more important, include characterization, plot, uh, and dramatic effectiveness. And in this session, uh, we wish to explore the value of some of these other techniques, historical fiction techniques, for archaeological research. So before that, what do these four series of Spartacus do so well that inspires us to embark on the trail of fiction? Which one are we on, that one? Okay. Uh, no, this, this one. There we go, right. Um, so, for example, in contrast to the, the very elite perspective and the theatrical feel of uh, I Claudius, for example, which defined a, a, a sort of a generation of, uh, uh, sort of representation of Rome, Spartacus directs great effort into creating a socially diverse and visually very detailed world. It evokes an excellent sense of the competitive politics of first century BC Italy, Roman Italy, and engages with very real life dilemmas. You know, how do you feed a growing slave army? At the same time, however, it trades on cartoonish violence and introduces a series of fantastical components which suggest that total authenticity is not the intention, from far from the intention. Notably, some of that fantasy applies to aspects about which we are very well informed, both historically and archaeologically. We know an awful lot about the types of fine wares and coarse wares, for example, that were in use in Italy during the early first century BC. But the ceramic vessels, another uh, sort of material culture that we see, seem to be very generic cups and flagons and that sort of thing. So why distort or exaggerate very basic visual aspects and then maintain other arcane details, speech idioms and the, uh, the titles of Roman officials and details of uh, Roman politics? Perhaps CGI, particularly in the case of Spartacus, has brought us to the point where ever greater authentic detail and representation is a, is a diminishing return. Perhaps suspension of disbelief is no longer served by what we see so much as by what we feel. In other words, is there rather more in common between I, Claudius and Spartacus than first meets the eye? Ultimately, both succeed not through realism, but through characters, through emotion, and as we'll argue in our own paper uh, in a moment, empathy. At this point, it's important to emphasise that uh, our interests in this session, at least initially, are rather uh, selfish. That, can we see that? It was a bit gloomy, isn't it? But Dan had to explain to me the significance of this slide, because I'm not culturally informed enough. But uh, through engaging with the wider public, and though engaging with the wider public and captivating, uh, with captivating tales of our <laughs> academic research is clearly an important activity, and we, we're very keen to do that. Here we want to focus particularly on 
um, the point made by Brian Fagan that writing in captivating ways is important for scholarly and academic writing as well. It's not just a means of outreach. And specifically, we believe that these techniques are uh, not just about the presentation of our results, but also about doing better research. Can we use these approaches to ask new questions of our evidence? So in this session, we really want to explore the similarities and the differences uh, and, the, and to understand the boundary, if there is one, uh, but, uh, between fiction and archaeology uh, and what, in particular, these fictional techniques might be able to offer uh, to academic archaeology. So we start with a, a simple question. To what extent do archaeologists and the creators of historical fiction share aims and methods and make use of one another's materials and techniques. Now, Traditionally, novelists and filmmakers look to academics to provide their raw materials, i.e. the facts, on which to build their characters and plots. But is this fact-to-fiction to route a one-way street? What about the perspective of archaeologists who, uh, uh, who, happen to, uh, who uh, try to do fiction for themselves? What are their aims uh, and methods and results? And here's just a quote from um, uh, Margaret Elphinstone and uh, her work with uh, Caroline, who will be speaking in a moment, um, which is a very sort of uh, illuminating quote about uh, our attempts, in a sense, at archaeological writing, where we're trying to get away from the facts, haven't provided a novelist, in this case, with the kind of details that they wanted to, to, uh, to uh, narrate into their uh, stories. Well, generally, uh, a number of scholars, a number of archaeological scholars, uh, such as Michael Shanks, have made uh, calls for a greater and more explicit role for the archaeological imagination, in particular uh, accounts which employ fictional techniques to present imagined narratives bear strong resemblance to phenomenolo phenomenological archaeology, uh, and most recently to archaeologies of the senses, so I'm thinking um, uh, Yanis Hamalakis's work and, and Robin Skeets's work. Is the work of Tilly and, and some of these other scholars really so different in motive and form from writers of historical fiction, exploring experience, evoking emotions? By engaging in some of these multi-sensory uh, multi approaches, some archaeologists and novelists, we would argue, are, are actively working along similar lines already. But there are differences. So note, for example, the lack of characterization and plot in phenomenological account, uh, accounts. <coughs> And it has to be said, historical novelists also work very hard to make their products into page turners. <laughs> so some advantages and disadvantages will become uh, more explicit when we move on to broader fictionalised accounts, whether introductory vignettes uh, or more extended treatments. At this point, I'll hand back to Dan. Yes. Uh, despite powerful disciplinary... Uh, distinction between factual history and fiction, there is no shortage of examples of fictionalized accounts to be found in scholarly works. But are such accounts Velcro additions to otherwise objective texts, or are the, um, or do they indicate that the rest of the text is qualitatively different? Are these fictional scenes the final product, the outcome, or can they feed back into the research process? Keith Hopkins's book, A World Full of Gods, explores this question in an extended reflexive experiment. Um, in one case, uh, Hopkins employs time travelers to offer, and I quote, immediacy and informality. They can describe what stru struck them as strange and yet what the Romans took for granted. Interestingly, almost the exact same words were used by Stephen Mithen to describe his decision to use a time traveling observer in his 2003 book, After the Ice although he reflects far less upon the epistemology of the format. Hopkins's book incorporates commentaries on, on his writing by other scholars, uh, real or otherwise. Um, for example, one identifies the ser a series of problems such as the cream bun syndrome. One story may be amusing, two stories may be tolerable, the third story sticks in the gullet, and any subsequent story makes your, uh, your satiated audience feel more than slightly sick. He continues, stories tyrannize and infantilize their audience. When you tell stories, how can I respond except with a polite smile or a yawn, a laugh or another story? This quote, of course, provides the inspiration for the, uh, for the session title. <laughs> <laughs> 
In a recent collection of papers on subjects and narratives, Jonathan Thomas takes us through his own attempts to deploy alternative narratives about uh, Upper Paleolithic Venus figurines with the intention of better understanding the meaning of these objects in both past and present. After much um, experimentation, however, he concludes, it turns out that I could not be the servant of contemporary literature, the archaeological record, and critical theory all at once. This raises important issues, um, not least, what are the author's aims, and what are the audience's uh, his expectations? By attempting to uh, service every agenda and audience, we may end up satisfying none. Another e uh, key uh, issue identified in this collection is talent. Are archaeologists archaeologists and novelists novelists precisely because they have different talents? Um, talents which are not easily learned, uh, although some people in the room obviously disprove this. Um, the answer to this question is in part also related to aims and audience. If the aim, as we will go on to argue, is, the, uh, is not the product but the process, then a best-selling novel may not be the only measure of success. The critical commentators within Hopkins' book that provide an insight into his methods uh, parallel critique of phenomenological approaches and what Andrew Fleming has called the hyper-interpretative um, archaeology. Specifically, Fleming addresses the compulsion to go beyond the evidence and to engage with imagination. In particular, he focuses on the people with which we populate our imagined pasts. Indirectly, he identifies an interesting difference between the characters used by historical novelists to drive the narrative and engage the reader and those created by archaeologists. It, our sense of responsibility to give voice to the people uh, who are not normally heard um, results in very worthy but rather dull people. Um, Fleming notes, outside satire or parody, we are unlikely to find a contemporary archaeologist writing a narrative vignette like this. As he clubbed the odious bastard to death, he was conscious of how well his skull lo would look in the wall niche, something to give the wife a thrill when doing the dusting, and how good a few slices of his thigh would taste, accompanied by a dandelion salad. Right, so might we be patronising our uh, fictional characters rather than idealising them? Um, they're certainly very one-dimensional when we compare them to the complex and ambiguous individuals, for example, of Spartacus. Do the characters of the House of Batiatus, for example, better depict the way in which people might be simultaneously marginalised and empowered by Roman imperialism? When we seek to bring the past to life, what type of life, um, what type of life specifically are we talking about? And are there ethical differences between the responsibilities of archaeologists and novelists, either towards the people of the past or, and or to disciplinary boundaries. Some are keen to police those boundaries, but others find the dividing line much less clear. For example, um, as a result of their collaboration, the novelist Margaret Elphinstone, who we saw earlier, uh, and Caroline Wickham Jones at the front here, one of our speakers this afternoon, have argued that the differences here um, between archaeology and historical fiction are generic, not intrinsic. In other words, it's a, a question of emphasis. In our quest for better archaeology through fiction, we note that a number of archaeologists who have explored the use of historical fiction have remarked how it has improved their scholarly work. So, for example, Caroline, uh, in her article with uh, Margaret Elphinstone, remarks that it occurred to me I'd never tried to make my idea of, the, of Mesolithic life actually work. Uh, Kathleen and Michael Gear argue that the process of fiction writing will sharpen your wits and skills, since fiction takes you in directions you never would have considered and poses problems that the archaeologists must solve in order to continue the story. Some very practical examples are also provide, uh, provided by James Gibb, another of our uh, speakers this afternoon, um, who describes the process of, uh, how the process of playwriting can stimulate research questions and explore possible explanations. So for these archaeologists, historical fiction is not what happens after the research is over, but part of the research process. So after the story has been told, we need to go back to the data with the perspective that we've gained through storytelling. This academic emphasis on process, we think, seems to mark something of a difference from the, the novelist's or the filmmaker's emphasis on product. For the archaeologist, 
the value of historical fiction lies not so much in the, the artistic merit of the final novel or film, it might do, but not, not necessarily, but particularly it lies in the under, uh, sort of improved understanding of the questions uh, that might be asked and the interpretations of the data that might be brought about. Another key question is whether there are any ethical or epistemological differences between writing accounts of prehistoric periods and historical periods, and it's striking um, in our own trawl of the data that most novels and academic writing that we've come across on these topics seem to focus more <coughs> on historical periods for which there are a narrative framework exists uh, and for which historical individuals can be identified. But if less numerous, there are certainly plenty of prehistoric novels out there. Can prehistory provide the individuals and the events needed for empathy and narrative uh, and all those sort of key fictional techniques. Luckily we have a, a, a panel of speakers today that represent a variety of chronological uh, interests and, and uh, uh, research, so hopefully that's one of the issues that we can explore. So with the belief that fictional and academic narrative are generically the same, but with questions, many questions still unanswered as to how we move forward, we can see that the benefits of engaging with, or we believe that the benefits of engaging with historical fiction are compelling, but quite hard to specify, quantify even. The methods had promise, but they resist easy replication. Our aim with this session this afternoon is to uh, explore those questions, and hopefully our speakers are going to be able to help us shed some light on that. Thank you.